an upper ankle sprain has ended the promising rise of Abigail Simpson. I decided I wanted to coach the next group of Olympic hopefuls. Don't let him get there! Stop! We lost. It's high time. I did something about it. Your own ice hockey team. Certainly a bold idea, Prince John. Well, we're going to make that dream become a reality. I think I've got just the location. Evanston. Evanston. The Evanston Monarchy. Oh! oh! Ruined. Well, I'm sure we can fix it. So who ran into you? Some guy with a fancy foreign accent. Don't go matchmaking me again. Abby was an Olympic hopeful. Do you feel like you didn't live up to your full potential? You have no idea. The owner of this building is thinking of closing it entirely. Look, I really love my school, but I just don't know how to salvage it. This ice rink would make a beautiful sports facility. You're the one that's trying to put us out of business. I've made a real mess of things. He's never found a woman who could hold her own with him. You made me start believing in myself again. Sometimes opposites do attract. But do they live happily ever after? Sometimes you just have to take a chance. Hello and welcome to yet another Stocking Stuffer. Uh, this one is one of my favorite types of movies for a lot of reasons, including ice skating and also budget. We'll get to all of those things and more, but I can't go ice skating on my own. Have you seen how clumsy I am? I need to hold on to something. I need somebody to help me up and then I make them fall. And today, that person who I'm going to skate over his hand most likely is none other than... A podcast extraordinaire, uh, a, a professional, a legend in the field of covering movies that are even worse than the ones I watch for fun. I am, of course, talking about the one and only Doug Tilly of Cinema Smorgasbord. You know him from many other ventures, including really what I always associate with him, which is Eric Roberts is the fucking man. S- Doug, welcome. Thank you. Somewhat a lovely intro you gave me. And yeah, how appropriate is it? You know, I should mention it. I didn't mention this to you before we started recording, but uh, a little new park uh, just opened up right around the corner from where I live, and it has a ice skating rink within it. Ooh. I know. It's, it's, it's like it was meant to be. Now, I should mention also, I don't know how to skate. <laughs> I've never done it before. Uh, I know I'm Canadian. I know it, that, that seems like it shouldn't make any sense. Well, but you and, said you've never done it before. So how do you know? If you just went on the ice, you probably could be Brian Boitano right there. I mean, you know what? It's possible that mm-hmm. I'm so light on my feet that when I go out there, I'd just be, I'd be like, uh, this is a very Canadian reference, another Wayne Gretzky out there. Oh, but, yes, uh, indeed. Or, or Brian Orser. Or, or Brian Orser. Or Browning or a mm-hmm. Stoiko. You could be um, Keegan Messing yeah, I, if you want to get contemporary. <laughs> I, I, none of my references are contemporary. <laughs> <laughs> they're, hey, they're, they're all current in my heart. You were, uh, just to pull back the curtains a little bit, you were uh, going to have me on this podcast to talk about one of these uh, Christmas films uh, that are very, very popular in the year of our Lord 2022. And you uh, offered a few up, but you had previous to that, I don't know how it came out, mentioned that you had an interest in figure skating and the fact that this particular movie that we're about to talk about also has a figure Mm -hmm. skating bent to it though not as much as one might think (laughs) considering its title and how it's all themed but that it's about it i was when you put the put it out there i was like you know what simpatico it's perfect thank you you. figure skater enthusiast Mm -hmm. me someone whose mother watched so much figure skating and i just watched whatever was on tv so i also watched a lot of it uh and now i can't skate and so maybe that just makes me more impressed with the whole motion and and mechanics of figure skating so i was just i was hyped and jazzed um thank you for doing this for me that is so Mm -hmm. kind of you oh yeah well i mean it it really it is a little selfish as well i just like to talk about things so if so as as, (laughs) when you reached out i was whatever you said you could have said sallow i would have been like yeah let's let's (laughs) put it on tomorrow and then i would have said wait a minute is there a sallow on ice and then i would have (laughs) sent me down a dark rabbit hole you so, need you need the Zamboni after that. <laughs> <laughs> so funny story. I'll give my figure skating experience. Now I love watching figure skating. I've watched it my whole life. Uh, I got Peacock just to watch figure skating, and then suddenly Peacock isn't showing it the same way because of music rights issues. So now I'm finding other ways on the internet to watch it. Um, all of that being said, I have tried ice skating twice in my life. Both times were disastrous in different ways. 
the one time I went and I like kept falling so much to where there are employees at a rink who skate around just to help people up. And I made that guy fall. Mm. Um, But then the other time was even better. I was at a rink and we're skating around kind of by skating. I mean, I am holding onto the bar and just inching my way one step at a time and falling every like five steps. I am about halfway across the rink doing this. It's taken me probably about 45 minutes when they blow the whistle for the Zamboni to come in and clear the Ooh, ice. Okay. Um, I am halfway across the ice. There's no exit where I am. I have to go all the way half to get to the exit. I just fucked. Keep, Dead I, meat. I just kept shuffling. I just keep, you know, inching my way over. <laughs> they are blowing the horn. I hear people screaming. I hear my friends yelling, Emily, get off the ice! And I just look everybody and I just shrug because what they what they want me to do? They wanted me to leave my comfy bar and skate halfway across the ice and just fall splat on my face and hope that I fell with enough force that I slid all the way to the end. No, I just kept inching. Eventually, there was an emergency exit that they had to open for me, and I got off the ice. Mm. So I, I would say, mistaken. Emily, that's a humiliating story. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I was a, I was a confident nineteen, uh, and uh, you know. In, in his own way, it was not the worst thing that could have happened. The worst thing that could have happened would, was me saying, okay, I'll try, and then broke my nose skating in the middle of the rink. So. Look, what you should have done, and, and I know it's too you – can't, you can't unwind the watch. Mm. But what you should have done is just protest it. The protest would have been, fuck this. I'm not inching. I ain't skating. I'm here. This is my ice. I'm a confident, intelligent person. Mm-hmm. I'm going to sit here, yeah. and if that fucking Zamboni – Wants to run me over. over. This will be your own. And My I mean, blood I is on your this hands. Reference. This is going to be your own Tiananmen Square moment. <laughs> and you're going to be out there in the middle of the ice and you were like, do your work. Do I it. mean, you'd be a hero. I would, but it would have been really cold if I sat down because it's ice. Yeah, well, so it would have just been like cold. after like two minutes. I'm like, oh, my butt. OK, fine. Yeah. I don't know how, how high my pain tolerance was back then. So, yeah, I like, missed my heroism opportunity. Your level is just dropping yeah, by the minute. Clearly, clearly. <laughs> I missed my chance at, you know, really making a statement for the clumsy fat kids who can't figure skate. It's true. Look, <sighs> we, we, need, we need a champion, and you were almost that champion. I know. I, I had my... I had my brush, um, and I and I failed it. <laughs> uh, and a, a lot of those memories came back in watching a royal Christmas on ice. Uh, now everybody heard the trailer, but we are going to talk a little bit about the story. Uh, let's go first in the background of this movie. It is um, it's on Tubi. I don't know that it was made for Tubi. I think it was made for whoever would buy it, and it ended up going to Tubi, which feels very appropriate. Directed by. Somebody many, many, I think, film people of our ilk are familiar with. Uh, one Fred Olin Ray. Doug, what is your experience with Fred Olin Ray? Uh, I would say extensive. Certainly mm, when I, I was... W- I would gather. <laughs> when I was getting into, um, you know, exploitation and horror mm-hmm. movies, as we all did, in the 1990s, he, 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 his was a name that popped up again and again. He very much was of that straight-to-video, low-budget horror yep. era of the 1990s, even though, of course, he really kind of... Um, got his start and really established himself in the 80s. I think I've watched a lot of his movies. Uh, you know, probably in the last decade, I've watched a lot of his 80s movies and sure. really started to appreciate him as a craftsman, right. the craftsman of like Hollywood chainsaw hookers, let's say. Sure. A lot of <laughs> movies that have bikini in the title, totally. Yeah, absolutely. But I, I think a very talented, low budget horror yeah. and sci fi and exploitation director who has, like so many of his ilk, including. Including the legendary David Dakota, who we <laughs> run into a lot over. Yes, we do. I, I mean, we run a lot. A shared into, acquaintance, basically, of you yes, and I. That, basically, he walks across all worlds. Yes, but uh, Fred Olin Ray has moved into the Hallmark ish um, Christmas and uh, thriller type low budget mm-hmm. films that uh, seem to be all the rage. Uh, and I should say that his most recent credit is Dog Napped Hound, Hound for, for the, the Holidays. Holidays, I know. Um, so, I mean, you know. I will say that that was one of the things that was most appealing about this movie was, oh, I wonder what Fred Olin Ray has been up to. I did <laughs> see a movie of his for, hmm, I can't remember if it was for Eric Roberts. <laughs> I, I was going to say, I'm sure he must have done worked with Eric Roberts a lot. It it just seems natural that that would have happened. It, it I can't remember. Well, I don't think we have covered one of his movies, but uh, I did for some reason watch his movie called Sniper special ops 
and that is a uh, Steven Seagal movie, and it's real bad. And Steven Seagal, what? Sits, he, I know no. it's hard to believe. He, he sits down a lot in it. But one, <laughs> one of the things people might know this for, and this is a, this is kind of a very off-topic thing, but I'm going to bring it up anyway, Please. is that the poster for it it says Seagal and Van Damme sniper special ops, and you're like, oh my god, Steven Seagal. Jean Claude Van Damme, but no, it's not. It's, it's uh, like Jimmy Van Damme. No, it's Rob Van Damme, the pro wrestler, uh, oh, is also one of the stars okay. of Sniper Special Ops. But I, you know, ca- that kind of carny tradition mm-hmm. is it actually does kind of appeal to me because I'd be like, oh, you got me, Fred Olin That's, Ray. Yeah, I'll give you credit for it. Just uh, like you got me in this, uh, where I expected to see a lot of uh, talented figure skaters. <laughs> Or talent, yeah. Yeah, we did. I think we've only done one other movie of his on the Stocking Stuffers, and that was Holiday Road Trip, which Mm. is a pretty – I mean, it it is very terrible. Uh, It is notable for a few things. Um, Patrick Muldoon is in it, which isn't surprising. He's in a lot of these. George Hamilton, Shelley Long. Um, But most importantly – Oh, Susan Olsen of The Brady Bunch. I I didn't get to the biggest star of all in Holiday Road Trip. It was the last film of Uggy. Oh! Mm-hmm. Yeah, Uggy, the dog who starred in The Artist, the little Jack yeah. Russell. Uh, it, it is not very good, and it's one of those, like, kind of like when you look at what happens to a lot of great actors, and, like, their last film is, I don't know, um, a Fred Olin Ray movie. <laughs> so, you know, it, it had its own uh, charm to it, I guess. Much much like um, A Royal Christmas on Ice. Uh, now, something else interesting on this movie, in IMDb, they credit the screen or the screenplay. So the right it lists Fred Olin Ray as writer and then Jeffrey Shank and Peter Sullivan as story. Mm-hmm. Jeffrey Shank and Peter Sullivan have shown up like seven times this season already in these. Yeah, yeah. They do. A, I mean, they have like 70 credits a year. Mm-hmm. But the fact what's funny, the movie, when the opening credits go, they're not credited in the screenplay or story at all. Right. So I wonder if it's just one of those like. Look, you, it, there's only three plots that we've recycled so many times. So, look, Fred Olin Ray, you may have written your own script, but technically this is the same movie we've made five times. So we have to give a story credit to these guys. That's my theory on that. There might be something to it, or maybe they're involved with the production company in some way. So they're like, you just got to put us in there because we just yeah. got to stock up on these. Yeah. But, I mean, the, the the number of these productions that, that Peter Sullivan and Jeffrey Schenker oh are involved gosh. in is ludicrous. I mean, it It's ludicrous, but... I mean, I, we get this a lot over at Eric Roberts' The Fucking Man. Mm. It's ludicrous, but it's not impressive. You know what I mean? Where it's just yeah. like, look at all this incredible work that, I mean, none of it is I – mean, with Eric Roberts, every once in a while, you'll hit one that's pretty decent. But, sure. I mean, it's a lot of it is, is – let's say it's samey. I think samey is mm. the right word for it. I, I'd agree. I think even this one, which – Real Christmas on Ice – is – has all those things of like, oh, there's an ice skating element. Oh, there's a prince element. And yet they don't even like – makes sense together like it really does feel like it was a um somebody was playing uh what am i thinking like magnetic poetry of give me a couple (laughs) of plot threads i'm gonna mash them together and have a movie and that's what we got uh so why don't we go into the the plot of this movie would you like to give your plot plot synopsis roughly kind of tell us what happens in this movie i think i have a pretty good memory of Mm -hmm. what occurred in this movie so (laughs) There's a woman named Abigail, and she lives in a small town. Mm -hmm. And she, uh, unfortunately, she was once a great figure skater and almost made the Olympic team, but suffered a debilitating injury. And instead of, you know, yes, please. Was she injured, or was it like she fell at nationals and was embarrassed and then quit figure skating? I think there was a suggestion of some sort of small injury. But there's certainly not as a suggestion that the injury was enough to stop her from ever figure skating again. And this movie does that thing that a lot of... um, kind of mainstream media does when it comes to figure skating, which is uh, according to every, th- there's, yeah, they get it wrong. <laughs> according to like everybody that it doesn't actually watch figure skating, they're convinced that like figure skaters go into hibernation for three years and then come out for the Olympics and then go back into hibernation. No, like figure skating is a thing that happens every year. <laughs> like yeah, there are other year. tournaments, there are other championships and there's touring productions. There's they, touring they come here. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's what you do when you flunk out mm-hmm. of being one of the best in the world. You go on these touring productions and you probably do pretty, darn well you become a muppet on ice and it pays yeah it pay- that's it dollar dollar bill mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and i have to say and this i know that we're this is very early because i barely got i haven't even mentioned the prince yet <laughs> god um, the prince i have i have a couple of notes written i don't usually write a lot of notes because i like to go off the dome but in this case i just wanted to mention right off the start the crux of this story 
which is this idea that Abigail has now she started teaching figure skating yeah. because you know she she flunked out can't go to the Olympics. And uh, her first figure skating shows that she puts on with her little team there, they don't do very well. And the big thing in this put on a show aspect of this movie is that by the end, she needs to put on a show. And the only way that she can make that show successful is to advertise herself as as appearing in it and skating in it. Here's the thing. If you 10 years ago didn't make the Olympic team, <laughs> no one gives a fuck no, they if do you not. are now going to skate. No. And if they in your small town, if they were to give a fuck... They already know who you are. Yes. It's a small town. Everyone knows that she was the woman who almost made it to the Olympics because that's how small towns work. Even small bits of fame are like, you know, mentioned. And everyone, it's not like she's not visible. Everyone in the town yeah. seems to know her. So I'm just saying, this this movie doesn't make any sense. But going back to the story. I was going to say, once you get to the prince, it really starts to click. That is the entirety of Abigail's part. Mm -hmm. The only other thing is that she is friends with a local uh, a, a guy who owns a restaurant who makes desserts. I guess it's a dessert place. I was and very confused because I thought it was just a bakery, but then people kept saying they were having dinner there. So yeah, I guess Al. he just really he likes just... doing bake bake baked goods in Perhaps. there. Yeah, maybe it's like she pot also, pie all the time. She does have a quirky best friend, mm -hmm. uh, of course, and who, who seems a lot cooler and nicer yeah. than she does. I would have taken um, her movie. But that is the entire side of that mm -hmm. story. But here's where it gets good. Cool. Here's, <laughs> by good, you mean terrifying. So there's a prince. And he is played by the actor Jonathan Stoddard. And he he's not from England. Where is he from? Do you remember? <laughs> he is hand? from a burg outside of Belgium. Belgium. That's right. Yeah. Which is a good explanation for why no one would recognize him elsewhere. Yeah. But he speaks with a um, <laughs> English accent. <laughs> Cough, cough, cough. Uh, and he is obsessed with the sport of hockey. <laughs> yes, the, he the is. Beloved, beloved sport in my country here of Canada. Uh, he loves hockey, and he loves it so much that even though it's very close to Christmas and his mother is going to want him there to celebrate all the Christmas stuff that rich people celebrate, he wants to fly off to the United States of America because he has a guy there – He's going to make a deal, and they're going to invest in or start. It's a little hard to explain exactly how it comes out <laughs> in the movie. He's going to be involved in a minor league hockey mm -hmm. team. And <laughs> there's a lot of this that doesn't make a lot of sense to me, and I'm not really – I don't know about the ins and outs of minor league hockey business. I don't think Fred Olin Ray does either. But he the, – the person that he's meeting with is Billy Baldwin, one of yeah. the Baldwin brothers, uh, featuring some absolutely – astounding eyebrows in this. I just can't... Mm -hmm. They point towards the heavens. They are really... They are giving the best performance in this movie by far. The highest production value that we see in this movie is when the two meet for the first time and they are in the stadium that the Buffalo Sabres play in. Oh! You can see the Buffalo Sabres logo oh. in the background. And there's a, there's, there's a suggestion that that is where the minor league team would play, but of course that's impossible. Mm -hmm. So what Billy Baldwin does, he sends him to a small town that he, he's been looking at because they have venues that might be perfect. And I guess it's like uh, the minor league team might like even move around to different places, but this would be their home base. He wants them to check it out. He just wants the prince to go there, soak in that small town atmosphere, and really get to know the people there. And I do have to say, Jonathan Stoddard, he cannot do an accent to save his fucking life. Not even a little bit. Yeah. But he does have a certain level of charm to him, and maybe it's helped along by the fact that he is a perfect man, right? I mean, in this movie, he is handsome and charming, wants to help all the time, nice to everybody, yeah, incredibly so... rich but not full of himself, has a down-to-earth aspect because he likes hockey and he's got this interest, doesn't want to show off or anything like that. Perfect Doug, dude. have you never seen a Lifetime thriller that where the villain is Prince John? Uh, well, no. The only Lifetime thrillers I've seen involve a doctor. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> stalking people. <laughs> stalking and, people. And including... Funnily enough, Mar <laughs> Abigail in this, she's one of the people that she's was stalked by one of those doctors. <laughs> so this movie, to me, felt like Stalked by My Prince, because <laughs> the character of John, A, gives off, which is true of a lot of these movies, where the man is so perfect and so mm -hmm. good looking, and yet, mm -hmm. and yet he's single. Isn't that weird? It's not weird if the reason he's single is because he murdered seven I'm of his ex-girlfriends because they got freaked away out by too. him completely. Mm -hmm. So to yeah. me, I got such creepy, stalkery vibes from John. I got creepy, um, what's the word, 
um, like supportive vibes from everybody else in town, from her parents who are all but laying out condoms for the two of them. Um, I found this relationship very uncomfortable and just, it just creeped me out so much. Uh, well, I mean, obviously we're looking at the, the this through two different lenses. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm so he gets to the city. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. I'm just going to continue okay, and plow please. through this, this terrible plot. We have 80 minutes um, to get through. Totally. Yeah, exactly. So there are uh, some other elements here uh, where Abigail has an ex in the city named Chad. Uh, and he of used to be like football. Yeah, I know, right? He used to be a member of the football team. They apparently had some sort of previous relationship. He's set up as if he's going to be, like, the troublemaking yeah. ex, but he kind of just goes away. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> to the point where even when she puts on her big figure skating thing at the end, he's cheering louder than anybody. I guess he just doesn't care about the, all the stuff that happens before. Uh, so Prince John arrives in this small city. Small town, I should say. Uh, and they meet each other in that classic way where meet she has cute. picked up – uh, yeah, meet messy is what it is. <laughs> she picks up a cake for uh, an event that evening. He runs into her quite literally. She kind of runs into the... him. I, I don't know. Replay her. the tape. Yeah, I mean, she was very upset. She's very blamey. I mean, honestly, she has a bit mm-hmm. of an attitude. I don't know she if I'm does. allowed to say that. She's the uh, worst. She's she's pretty. She's. Hmm. I don't want to be <laughs> too judgmental, but maybe she's just having a bad week or whatever. But she is terrible to everybody in yeah. this. Abigail gets ran into. He is inconsolable about this. He's so upset. He's like, please, I'm so sorry. I'll go in. I'll purchase another cake for you. But, of course, the cake takes some time to to be made. She has to get her friend who owns this cafe to make another cake, which he seemed pretty okay with. But it it just makes her madder and madder. And what happens is this guy, he ends up picking up the cake from this place and even bringing it to the event. Mm -hmm. He he really just wants to make good. And also – he seems to have developed eyes for mm-hmm. young Abigail. So I don't know if we need to go into every story beat after that, but you can kind of work out how this is going to come together. But the big issue, I'm sure there's two. We need issues. we need to know the conflict definitely. The two con- there's kind of two. It's a two for conflict though. And one of them, <laughs> one of them, one of them makes sense, but not in the context of the movie. Yes. And the other one doesn't make sense even in the context of the movie. Fair. The, the two things are one is that the the place that she's been practicing her figure skating. It's a small stadium, and uh, she is apparently having trouble making rent or whatever for the – she isn't renting the whole place, but I guess she owes them some money or something like that. And, and they're thinking of selling it, and she's a little worried about that. She feels really bummed, and that's one of the reasons that this figure skating meetup or this this thing that she's putting on has got to be really successful. Though I don't see how that's going to make the difference. How many days a week could she possibly be renting this fucking like, thing? And it's how like many? Day, how right? much are they charging for tickets for the show? The, the skaters weren't very good. I mean, I, yeah, I know well, it's hey, like Western New York. There isn't that much to do, but there's stuff to do. So what she finds out, you might have already put this together, listeners, is – that the hockey team mm. that the prince is trying to invest in, that's the place that they're looking at. Of course, when he finds out, he's like, oh, of course, I'm not going to buy that. I'm not going to interrupt you. He already loves her, obviously, so he's not going to do it. She does not hear that. She nope. says she, she basically acts like he meant to fuck her over, even though that makes no sense whatsoever mm-hmm. for anything. And he is completely baffled and you know apologetic immediately, but... That's only half of it. The other thing that she's really upset about is the fact that it is revealed that he is a prince. Now, they, at this point, have only had four <laughs> encounters. Not I'm going to say, like, three, maybe a total of, like, 48 hours of knowing each other, right? Yeah, they only known each other for 48 hours. They've only seen each other maybe three or four times. And those times were the most... The, the most time they've ever spent together was just decorating some cupcakes. Yes. That is all they've really done together. And she is so angry about discovering that he's a prince because he lied to her, which he mm-hmm. didn't. Right. And, and and he had he was under no obligation. She she didn't know what he did anyway or what his whole yeah. deal was. I don't even think she knew his last fucking name. I don't know his name. No. Um, so I, her getting very upset about this. Now, I understand that that is probably what happens in all of these movies where because I'm my understanding is that there's a lot of these Christmas movies that, yeah. that are prince Oh, completely. Yes. And probably ones that are in other holidays too also have princes in them. I'd say one in every six includes a surprise prince or princess. This, I feel like I've seen this particular plot element in Hollywood movies as well where, you know, like a guy is hiding the fact that he's he's famous or rich or something like that and then someone gets upset. But that's after like... They've been together for months, and like he's yeah. like they've really developed in something. Her getting upset is so ridiculous that it makes her character 
toxic. It well, makes it, her the, character. The character already was toxic to me. It was before it absolutely, but she's she's angry at him be, because she because of the cake thing. She was angry, right. and though that's not understandable, that at least okay, we get it. She's angry about that. They'll eventually he'll warm her heart, and they'll realize that they have feelings for each other. The fact that then she makes a total one eighty and gets angry, like unreasonably angry, even to the point where her friend is like. Uh, he didn't lie. <laughs> what the fuck is wrong with you? He's a prince. You love him, and he's handsome, and I mean, like, he's literally perfect. And very rich, so, and can probably buy the stadium for you. Yeah, exactly. So it doesn't make any sense whatsoever, but uh, believe it or not, and this is going to be hard for anyone to who's listening to believe, uh, she does do the figure skating routine at the end, and kind of. he shows up. Yeah, well, it's there. there are people sure. wearing figure skating costumes <laughs> on ice. Yes, with blonde hair. And they uh, and he shows up for some reason dressed as as like his royal regalia, <laughs> dressed like as like Cinderella's prince, which again, there's, just there's, yeah, very much. So yeah, that's right. He does come out like Cinderella's prince. Like he went to like a spirit Halloween and looked for. Do you have adult prince? Oh yes, you do. Wonderful. And what is the return there's policy? Kind of a, <laughs> there is a kind of a funny thing too, where like when he. Uh, reveals to her that he was a, is a prince somehow that gets out to the entire community and he becomes like a local celebrity and part of the reason we hear that people are coming to see this figure skating thing is because he might be there and they all want to see a prince like who gives a shit i mean they already met the guy right they spent time with him yeah but they he... didn't see a prince on ice yeah they didn't see a you prince know? on ice and he also comes out it's like we're, uh, now i'm going to like do a routine with you but no he just stands there he and just... waits awkwardly <laughs> um and and I guess they get married and uh, shrug. I mean, it's, it's it all seems to work out. But uh, so my, th- that was that's this movie. The end. Indeed, uh, a royal Christmas on ice. That's a, that's basically everything that happens in it. Yeah. But there are some other smaller elements that I do think are worthy of discussion. Mm-hmm. Um, I- I'd say when this movie ended, I audibly went, "What." And my husband was in the room because it was like, I'm watching it before work. And he's just like, what's wrong? I'm like, I just, there were threads. There were plot threads dangling. And I'm not used to that in these movies because usually everything is so simple and resolved. And in this one, I really felt like, wait, so so what happens to the stadium? Wait, why did she forgive him? Wait, like it just, it felt there was something about this one in particular. And maybe it's that this was only 81 minutes, whereas most of these are 90, that it like, really did feel like somehow we were missing a scene or two that was just supposed to give it a little bit more because it ends and it it feels more sudden than usual and these all end very suddenly so I I don't know why this one like as much as I I'm not gonna lie I kind of loved this one because it was the kind I like where it's so cheap and so I don't know (laughs) yeah we uh, you got red you got green great we got a Christmas movie excellent like it has that attitude where they're not even trying to like be cute and pretty um, I like that the characters like th- their motivations don't make any sense. So no. they have to act like like she had to get angry because that's important for her to get angry. But they had no motivation for her to be angry, at least as angry as she got. And that happens multiple times in it. So what they end up doing is a a, a guy who does nothing but the right thing all the time. And a woman who is just angry always. Yeah. And we're supposed to think, hey, they should be a good couple. <laughs> They're going to be like, great. What could he possibly like about her? Yeah. I can't even think of one thing. Well, let, let's use that then to go into um, the 10 tropes that we get in all of these. Because the first okay. one is the lead in need of a lesson. Yes. And we have, so Abigail, it, it is baffling how, did you, here's a question. Did you see the movie Magic Mike? The first one. Man, I, you know what? I've, I, I, I'm a little embarrassed to say I haven't. I, maybe some people would say they're embarrassed to say they have, but no, not at all. I, <laughs> I really want to. I just was. It's, it's something I've always meant to catch up on. Mm-hmm. I, I love Steven Soderbergh. It, it sounds terrific. Everyone I know who uh, sees those movies loves them. I know another one's about to come out, so I was figuring that would come out. I'd end up catching up with all three. But please so, tell no, me more. The reason I bring it up is that the, yeah, the movie itself. There's a lot of great things going on in it. It's really fun. It's this. And yet there's this one glaring thing, which is the lead love interest is basically this woman. Um, mm. She's just this, like, moody, crabby, isn't charmed by the characters that we're all charmed by, but, like, not for good reason. Not because, oh, they're irresponsible, but just because, like, she's kind of a jerk. And that's what I felt watching this movie, where there was no reason for Abigail to be so miserable to every single person around her. And even if there was, well, then why would anybody around her still be friends with her? Because she was just 
awful and it wasn't the actress um so it's anna marie dobbins who was also in one of the stock by my doctors i think it's the one i didn't see i think that's like part four i think it's the sleepwalker one maybe okay i don't think i saw that one so it's not i don't want to put it on the actress per se because she's i feel like she maybe she didn't quite know what movie she was in maybe she maybe (laughs) again for all i know there was like a scene before this movie starts that got cut that explained everything but it's just the character herself is just such a wet blanket and not somebody I even have any reason to want to see made happy. Like, she's teaching kids ice skating, but it's not like, oh, well, you know, this kid's mom died in a fire and the only thing that brought him joy was ice skating, so I'm here for him. Or, you know, this this girl really doesn't seem to, she's really shy, but she comes to life on ice. Like, it, there's nothing, like, of that to kind of bring her to life. Like, no, it's just... A sad, spoiled girl who failed at her Olympic dreams and then just decided to be miserable for the next 10 years. Her lesson is strange, too, because in, I don't know how, how, what the lesson a lot of these uh, characters in these movies tend to. I mean, usually Christmas to. spirit is what it boils right. down to. Right, right, because they're down in the dumps or maybe they're just kind of miserable. And then they, you know, they find something that, that uh, usually a guy, I imagine. Often. <laughs> More often than not, with like one exception. <laughs> that makes them very happy. But the lesson that she needs to learn is that she needs to start putting herself front and center in the advertising for her <laughs> figure skating show. Like, that is what people say. It's like, you need to put yourself on the poster. I don't know why her poster, by the way, doesn't have her other figure skaters on them. Just to kind of really get across the idea that they do figure skating. But no, what we find out is that what really got people to pack that building was to put her and only her on the front of the poster and say that she's the star of the show. I don't know about that as a lesson. It doesn't really feel like it, it, it rings true to me. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Uh, so then moving into the setting, which is typically either a big bad city, a charming small town, or a magical winter wonderland. And here it is. Uh, now, they refer to it as Western New York. So I was recently, um, my husband and I took a trip up to Buffalo and um, Brockport and we were corrected when I said, oh, yeah, we're going, we're, we're doing an upstate trip. The lady at the Jell-O Museum in Brockport told me, no, you're not upstate, honey. You're in western New York. Mm. Um, so I want to be very careful to not offend people in western New York, because apparently they take that to heart. So we're in western New York, uh, which is presented here. They say it's Evanston, I think. I don't know if that was a real town or just the town they invented I for the movie. I think there's a part, and this is a very nerdy thing, so you please uh, bear with me here is that there's a part where they show the downtown and they show a mm-hmm. movie theater there. I spotted it. And I too. did a search for the movie theater. Yeah, and I believe this is East Aurora. Aurora. Yes. I, I saw that I you say it's a nerdy thing. Well, I I didn't look it up, but I thought it said I think that movie <laughs> signs as Aurora. I think I've heard of the town Aurora. So, yeah, I I'm guessing it's from there. Mm-hmm. I had a secondary reason for looking it up, which is because they had that scene in the Buffalo Sabres uh, stadium. Yeah. I wanted to see if it was filmed in Buffalo because my wife is from Buffalo. Oh, so I wanted nice. to see because she did not watch this with me. I did offer it, and she said, oh, fuck no. Uh, I love you, but not that much. If, I, if this was still in Buffalo, I probably could have convinced her. But, I mean, she would have spotted that this was not Buffalo right away. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, so in this town of Aurora slash Evanston, uh, we basically have an ice rink and a bakery, right? That's pretty much all there yes. is in the town. That's kind of what I gathered. There's some sort of, like, gathering space that they have. Like, they give out food to the needy oh, as well. Yeah. Uh, but that is just kind of like a generic third space. We don't know wh- where or what that is. I'm pretty sure it was one of the sets, just from a different angle. So yeah, and also uh, Abigail's mother's. Uh, I can't remember if she's at Abigail's house or at Ab- her own house. But yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, at one point we definitely see their own house. We do see that... a house. Yes, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there because... is at least three sets in this movie. That's true. Because they have dinner there, and of course, let's not forget we also see the. Magic Castle in jolly old, not England, but, you know, wherever his his palace is. And we get to see that uh, place. And we also get to see, hey, we get to see his hotel room, too. Now that I think about it, there's probably a good six standing sets for this movie. Yeah, well, I mean, that was probably the hotel room that some of the cast were staying in. Well, yeah, certainly so. But oddly enough, his hotel room had a Christmas tree in it. I don't think I've ever seen that before. (laughs) Watch a Christmas movie. You'll see see it a lot. (laughs) No, thank you. (laughs) (laughs) So number three is our bland love interest, uh, either a poor little rich boy or a widowed dad who, you know, does manual labor. Uh, in this case, I mean, he's a prince, so he's a poor little rich boy. Yeah. Um, so at what point, uh, so how many seconds into this man speaking did you clock the fact that he wasn't actually British? Probably second word. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and by I'm not then good at I that. knew. <laughs> I have to say, so 
I clocked him immediately. Clocked his manservant immediately that he's mm-hmm. not British. But I and I clocked that his mother was not British as well right off the bat. Okay, she only has one scene in the whole fucking thing. I do have to say I had to look up when they his brother shows up for one scene as well. I had to look up to see if his brother might have actually been British because I was like maybe they had I someone. One with of the them real accent. was was it the brother or the servant? Oh, did the serv the servant couldn't have been real? Are you kidding me? I was, one uh, of them had a Harry Potter credit, so I just assumed that meant British. Oh yeah, they played young Harry Potter in something, but I'm pretty sure he still was not British. Okay. But anyway, I saw that as well. I think that might have been the man servant. And if he was British, hey, mea culpa. But I thought that the brother <laughs> actually uh, sounded British Very, as well, but yeah. apparently not. I mean, look, it's hard to find someone with an accent or <laughs> someone that can do a legitimate sounding accent. To me, if you can't find someone who can do a British accent or is British, then maybe just put him, make him a prince from of... a country that doesn't have much of an accent, right? Well, or make yeah. him from some some weird, random, made-up place, because I think they kind of do that anyway. Always. And then just have him talk with some sort of funny accent, and then you can, uh, you'll can you have basically Prince Balky come out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. That's what they should have done. Well, even the fact that, you know, he says he's from, you know, some European country, and he says that's out of Belgium, yeah. which means he should have more of a French accent yeah, than a British accent more a fr- to begin yeah. with. <laughs> So, but I mean, look, I'm glad he didn't try that. That would have been intolerable. So. Oh, see, my thought on his British accent, it felt like this actor, so Jonathan Stoddard, it felt like he was, by being British, it's kind of like that thing that happens to Rachel Weisz in the reverse, where when Rachel Weisz does an American accent, like when she's British, she just, you know, she she can do a lot of things, but like her general speaking British voice sounds very intelligent and it's kind of deep, it's very sexy. When she does an American accent, it just sounds kind of like this. Yeah. And it's very like, ugh. Like, you kind of get the chills listening to it. What I felt about Jonathan Stoddard, the notes I took was, he's, in being British, he's clearly uncomfortable and he's doing something with his mouth that makes me feel like he is the male version of Scarlett Johansson and Under the Skin wearing human skin and trying to trying to be human (laughs) it just didn't feel like he always had this weird little smile on his face and it just fed into the fact that to me it felt like he was stalking this woman who didn't want anything to do with him um so everything about it just unnerved me (laughs) I, i mean there's only one actor in this who is a um who has done a lot of high budgeted productions and that is william baldwin who is the name in the cast Mm -hmm. right and i whenever they have a scene together where he's doing his shitty british accent um all i could think is like what could be going through billy baldwin's head just be like what am i doing here i can't what what are you doing here i can't believe i used my entire afternoon for this I am a Baldwin brother. I was in Slither. Are you kidding me? What am I doing here having to listen to this fake horseshit? But, hey, you know what? Everyone's got to work, right? Billy Baldwin's got to work just like anybody else. And I can't remember if he's done something terrible like any I know, number I, of his brothers. Stephen Baldwin is the, is the, the one that's like the kind of the crazy one. religious one. Yes. Alec Baldwin is, you know, a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Um, like, <laughs> the, the he ter- likes to call his daughter a pig. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Accidentally shoot someone shoot on a people. set. I mean, not a not a good record. Yeah, no. The, the joke um, <laughs> that I made watching this was that when Billy Baldwin showed up, and my, my husband started making jokes about how he was like, "Well, they wouldn't make Alan do that. Alec do this." I'm like, and my joke was, "At least I didn't kill anybody." Because I mean, if nothing else, William Baldwin does not have that on him. Uh, I feel like there's William... also the Baldwin that was in Vampires, John John Carpenter's band. But vampires. isn't that you mean Adam Baldwin? He's not related. No, no. To that. Okay. Adam Baldwin is the crazy. Is the crazy? Guy. Yeah. The, I the... try not to use that word crazy, but I mean. He is crazy. I mean, yeah, he's a mess. Uh, he's the one that's not a Baldwin brother. That's always easy to remember. Uh, but there is... Right. There is another Baldwin. It's and see, I should know Daniel, this because I'm a Daniel Long Islander. Baldwin. Daniel Baldwin. Oh, see, I always think... You know what? That's my problem. I think Daniel and William are the same one. I forget that Daniel yes. Baldwin is not. Because Billy Baldwin was kind of the hot one for a while. He was hot. Yeah, he was yeah. the Sliver ba- Baldwin. Yeah, you're right. He was the Sliver Baldwin. We were just talking about Sliver. Um... Daniel Baldwin, I think, was always kind of the um, the He's a chunky Baldwin, the, hef- the hefty Baldwin. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, I f- I forget about Daniel. And again, this, uh, I'm from Long Island, and like the Baldwins are one of those families that like everybody has some weird connection to. So I should have uh-huh. known all of this very carefully, but I I forget some of those details. So I, you know, I don't remember anything about Daniel. Which one was in the Purge series? Was it Daniel or Billy? Oh I boy, I don't know. I don't think it was. 
well, I mean, we can find out this very just, easily. Just, I'm, you so know. Why, don't you just, why don't you just talk for a second while I look yeah. up Purge? It is William Baldwin. Okay, uh, okay. So, so Billy, guess, Billy was in there. Billy is my favorite Baldwin then, very clearly. This is I a Purge That's, what, that's you know, how we figured this out. Royal Christmas on Ice. Nice. Oh, a Royal Christmas Purge on Ice. Yes, that's oh, right. I would, I would sell my soul to have that movie. I'm just putting that out there to the world. If, if you are a demon, think, I'll take it. If the Purge took place in the... The city who I'd want to kill first. <laughs> in, in your city? Oh, oh, in the city of fake. Aurora. Oh, in the city of this particular film, uh, and, and oh. the characters within it. Who I'm? Who I might try to kill? And I have to say, I might head toward Chad, but I'd end up at Abigail. <laughs> yeah. Um, Ab- Ab- Abigail would not be long for this world. Um, it's tough because I think once you take her, I would I would kill John because I just wouldn't trust him. I th- I think at some point he wants to see my insides. I really do. I I would just wouldn't trust that. And Baldwin would would go far. I feel like he would be the survivor. So take him out for you. Got you. Got to know your plan. Um, I'm teaming up with the sassy sidekick, uh, and then probably Al the baker because I think he oh, Al's would. Cool. Yeah, like and, and he'd Al. protect people for a while, and he'd do the right thing, which gets you down to the final two, and then you kill Al. Mm. And he kind of understands because you know at that point you got to survive. Well, Janet's going to, I mean, she's also pretty, anyway. But like, uh, yeah. yeah, We're yeah, getting off yeah. topic, but are we? Uh, so there's, okay, so that's our um, creepy, bland love interest. Number mm-hmm. four is our montages, of which there are always some in these movies. Mm-hmm. And in some cases, the the shorter the running time or the more, the less story, the more montages typically, because I have to fill the running time. Uh, did you clock any montages? Do you remember any specific ones? Oh, yeah, very much so. <laughs> I, I was watching it and I was like, well, the movie's almost over. I have not clocked a montage. Uh, maybe I skipped mm-hmm. it or missed it. But then we get an Abigail uh, longing for Prince John montage yeah. of all the things they've done together, which again was only three or four. <laughs> the two uh, activities they had. And right. it, it is my, it is the second time this season so far that we have had the uh, montage, my number two, my favorite type of montage, the recapping what happened in our movie just five minutes ago montage. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And of course, I mean, you have mentioned it several times. This is a very short movie. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's really no... only five minutes earlier. Even with my failing memory, I remember everything <laughs> that she was thinking about. But, you know, it makes sense. She's she's thinking about how she fucked up by being awful all the time. Yes. And her brain is like, hey, remember the good times when we just skated together with the prince on ice? Which is, by the way, the other thing that we didn't really mention, which is that Abigail, oh, yeah. because she's so tortured, because her life is so hard in this idyllic little town, the only time she gets to herself is going so out nice. on that ice and skating and moving her arms rhythmically <laughs> because she obviously does not know how to figure skate. <laughs> yes, that's always how they establish like sad figure skater is just the arm movements. If they like, <laughs> like they do like the soft wrists and then we understand everything. Now, when he was set up with the hockey team, I thought like he was going to be like a hockey player or like a hockey enthusiast, and they were setting up a cutting edge type situation. Oh, no, so um, we do want to talk about the cutting edge. Uh, the Yes, very much it had that energy of he's like, and it was weird because in the first scene, he's, he's obsessed with hockey and then it never comes back again. Like, I don't even, I don't think we see a hockey stick from that point on in the movie. If we even see it in the opening, we might not. We don't see any hockey players except for the ones that he watches on a television. And also, what channel is showing fucking hockey games in Belgium? But I mean, maybe, I mean, maybe they do. I don't know. But it, it, it is, it's funny that he could have been enthusiastic about anything but because they need to have that conflict with him wanting to buy the one place that she likes to be, that's why he has to be. But then it then it has to be set up. It's, it's yeah. ludicrous that he wants to invest in a minor league hockey team. And you know, <laughs> this is also something. Um, I've talked before about how in all of these movies, some there's like weird gendered things that happen that you don't notice until you watch like 17 of them a year. One of the things they always do, like for example, is when men and women drink in this movie – the women are always drinking wine. The men are drinking beer. Like, it's such a weird, like, the same idea of, oh, a cat is a female and a dog is a male. Like, yeah. that idea. <laughs> and they do the same thing. And this is not only done here, obviously, but it's the same idea on figure, like, ice. Ice is the surface. And there are two things you can do on ice. You can figure skate or you can do hockey. 
I don't think there has ever been a romance, and please somebody correct me if I'm wrong and then send me the link to it. If there has ever been a romance movie, particularly a Christmas romance movies, where it was a female hockey player and a male figure skater. Guess what, world? We have both of those things, but they'll never make a movie about that. So instead... Sounds kind of woke to me. I don't want to watch the woke (laughs) Christmas. We get (laughs) yet another cutting edge story where it's like the dopey male who likes hockey and the prissy like uptight woman who figure skates and it is and i love the cutting edge um i was telling doug i rewatched it the other night with my husband because i realized he'd never watched it uh it it is a, a very fun romantic comedy it is one of the mm-hmm. few ice skating movies out there but yet still it holds very strong to the like don't be man boy who's a hockey player and prissy ice princess who's a figure skater um but I should I I should use this moment to mention my DB Sweeney meetup, right? Well, it's uh, important for people to know that DB Sweeney is the hockey player in the in Cutting, the cutting Edge, Edge. The movie that if people. Prefer. If you haven't seen the Cutting Edge in some time, it's on Amazon Prime, so you can watch it easily. Uh, so DB Sweeney, who is in that, he's also his other probably big movie that a lot of other the other side of our fandom knows would be Fire in the Sky. Sure. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's funny. I, I mean, I do. Everyone knows that scene in, in Fire in the Sky. Uh, with the alien abduction and how scary it is. And everyone has that moment from their childhood where they saw that and they were like, this is the scariest movie ever. And then but they a lot of there's 85 think, other minutes in that movie. There's 85 other minutes and it's this like procedural like mystery that is not interesting at all. Yeah. And then you'll find people putting it on their like top 10 of the horror movies of that year list. And it's just like, you're just talking about one, one six scene. minute scene, it does not sir. Count. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, but, but so I did have a celebrity meeting um, with D.B. Sweeney. I was a couple years ago, I had gone to a Met game and it was very late. It was probably like 11 o'clock at night and I'm on the subway and I'm with a friend and for some reason, I mean, not for some reason, like it happens all the time. We were talking about the cutting edge that day (laughs) and we're leaving the game. We get to uh, uh, Grand Grand Central or um, Times Square, one of the subway stations, and we're transferring. So we walk up the stairs and we start crossing. And as we do, she grabs my arm and she's like, look. It's the guy from The Cutting Edge. (laughs) And sure enough, walking across the other way of the subway terminal was D.B. Sweeney there with like a friend. And I'm really drunk. I'm drunk enough that I um, was totally willing to go up and talk to him, but uh, and and also not drunk enough that I don't remember this very clearly. So I just saunter over, think like just all in my glory. And And as I'm walking, he he makes eye contact with me. And he immediately can tell exactly what I'm going to say. (laughs) No, he just sort of stands there and he stops walking and he just like comfortably leans back on his heels. And I just immediately, and of course in my mind, like now I'm like, so I was like, Mr. Sweeney, I'm a big fan of yours and I love doing the cutting edge. I'm sure what I actually did was like, oh my God, the cutting edge, you. (laughs) And I'm talking and I'm like, I, that movie helped me love my love of figure skating and and as i'm saying all these things he's nodding and he's reaching into his jack coat pocket and he pulls out a postcard and he just takes out a pen and he's like and what's your name honey i'm like emily he's like all right and he signs a postcard that he conveniently had in his shirt pocket he's like i'm so glad you love the cutting edge i have a new movie coming out with the girl from the cutting edge you know mora yeah she's in my new movie um, and he gives me a postcard, and it was for a movie that I've still never watched, and I really mm-hmm. should track it down. Nice. Uh, it's called, like, Two Tickets to Paradise or something. I think you might have directed it, too. Exactly. <laughs> it was, like, some direct DVD, early 2000s romantic comedy. Um, but, like, as I'm sitting there talking, he had written to me, he'd written, Emily, toe pick, exclamation point, D.B. Sweeney. <laughs> and, like, that was it. He's like, thank you so much for your support. You have a wonderful night. And he walked away. And it was, cool. like... He that heard it really clock cool. you. You were coming towards me. Knew exactly what <laughs> you were going to say. He about... knew. <laughs> okay, I... I'm going to give you, uh, Emily. I'm going to give you some notes on your anecdote. Oh yeah. Um, and here's what you got to change the next time you mm, say okay, it. Okay. Okay. Instead of running to, into him after some baseball game, it should have been a figure skating event. Oh, it should have been the yeah, event no. where you were stuck in the zamboni was about to run you over. Mm. And it was DB Sweeney who saw you out there and he was like, "That is a fan of the cutting edge." <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I can tell just by looking at her. I can and, save her. We're going to do a Palmchenko and throw her off the ice. And he saves you from the Zamboni. Yeah. Not that you need saving, but I mean, it would be a good opportunity. And that's where you met T.B. Sweeney when he saved you from the killer Zamboni. Yeah. And as I sat there, like, icing my knees, he gave me a postcard and wandered off into the distance, never to be seen again. Yeah, you were icing your knees just like they iced all of the mm-hmm. uh, the, the bakery stuff in this movie <laughs> that course. we're talking about. In- including the montage we didn't talk about, which is the cupcake frosting montage. I guess you're right. That is a yeah. montage. That's and 100% then a montage. that montage gets used in the other montage about what happened mm. in the movie. So it's meta montage. It was the most time they ever spent together was, it was. Uh, and it was frosting stuff. Did you get a lot of sexual tension from that frosting too? Well, he was squirting his cream all over the, the base. Yeah, goods. like there was that. And it was like, when they're doing it, it's coming out really bad. But then like the, when they show it, it looks very like attractive. Now that I did notice. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Some poor fucking intern had to put all the icing on. And this dude, he's like, oh, yes, you know, yes, put down another uh, tray of them. I know that the more are coming. And also, what, they're coming right out of the oven? He's trying to ice up piping hot You've Never ice uh, a cupcake. hot cupcake. You can't do that. Even I know that. Uh, uh, and – are you as convinced as I am that those cupcakes were then used to that? Like that was craft services. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yes. So, okay. I mean, you know, it keeps everybody happy. I get it. There's a yeah. big, big cast here, <laughs> yeah. uh, including all those poor ice skaters who had to do the, the last montage of the movie, which was just the ice show, which was mostly just skaters coming out and spinning. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> like one, of them, one of them does leave the the ice surface. For a small jump, so I mean, yes. there is something yeah, there. There's something. Yeah. I think, by the way, I think one of the ice skaters that they show in that montage is also the double for Abigail because she does the exact same move <laughs> where she bends her leg back at the end. So I think that's what I suspect. Uh, if I had. <laughs> you know, y- you might have watched movies before. <laughs> <laughs> so now, number five is our dead parents or dead wife, and disappointment. Uh, I didn't catch any. I mean, like y- y- clearly there was no king, so assuming. His father was dead, but no mention of it. I think it would be a stretch to say that there was a dead parent yeah. on display. And it if bothers anything, me. We should. If have anything, one. there's too many parents. There's too <laughs> many parents here. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll get to them in number nine. That does lead. That oh, leads into. Oh. I know. You know what? You're right. I'm going to hold off for number okay, nine okay. to tell the thing I'm going to say. Yeah. The, uh, okay. So sassy, because you know what? We have enough sassy sidekicks that that category is a bit crowded, so we can move the parents to sage old people. So sassy sidekicks, um, quite a few here. Uh, I would say the best performance in the movie is probably uh, Charlene Amoya as Janet, the best friend who's just like, hey, yeah, and uh, um, I said that exact same thing to you, but you didn't listen, and then this guy says it to you, and you do listen, so fuck you. I appreciated that. I thought they were setting up that she might have ended up with Chad at the end because mm. she spends one scene where she goes over with Chad basically to get him out of the way. Right. And then Chad has never established as being that much of a jerk that that couldn't have still worked out. But I have True. to say, the only real play for this movie is for Janet to have ended up with Prince John and Abigail to be left sad and alone. Sad and alone, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Apparently this actress, Charlene Ammonia, I mean, whatever her name is pronounced, uh, that she was on How I Met Your Mother. I've never seen that sitcom. Um, it's one of those shows where people loved it and then it ended and people hated the ending and then people <laughs> and then were hated like, the whole thing and then they ended up hating the whole thing because it's aged very badly but apparently she was on a bunch of episodes so maybe she had more bona fides than I gave her credit for yeah um, she was in Fear Street I don't remember her, who she was in Fear Street but she was in both Fear Streets or two of the three Fear Streets okay. so cool uh, yeah, no, I, 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 I star like yeah. of a royal Christmas <laughs> on ice. <laughs> she, I mean, she give her her own Christmas movie on ice next year uh, let's see we also have the butler um, so, okay, my theory on the butler, um, I am not, a, like, a royal family person, like, I, I only know everything about them, because you can't not know everything about them, at least in this country, I don't know if it's different in Canada, uh, the only thing I've ever, like, actively sat down and watched about, um, the royals was probably the, was Spencer, the Kristen Stewart movie, and my understanding of how, the thought, the thing I felt about this butler was what they, everybody has said about all the, um, people around diana was that she was surrounded by people she couldn't ever be alone but all of those people weren't there for her they were there for like the royal family and i felt that way about the butler because he's sort of presented as if like he's this guy's butler like he's his confidant but the minute uh prince john leaves town this butler's like hey queen let me tell you everything 100 percent. and i'm sorry if i sounded distracted 
did or was not paying attention to what you were just saying, but I did confirm that Robbie Jarvis is indeed British. I feel embarrassed about what I said earlier. Uh, He did indeed play, uh, I guess, a young Harry Potter's dad or something in Order of the Phoenix. He's in that, but he does live in L.A., but that... You know, begs the question what the fuck he was doing in this movie. But yes, <laughs> a real accent. I don't know why he didn't play the prince in that case. I mean, yeah. he's perfectly handsome enough to do such a thing. Um, but going back to what you're saying, yes, as soon as Prince John left, he completely ratted him out to everybody who would listen, to his brother, to his mother. Um, he did He did seem to be... I don't know if sassy would be the right way to describe him, right? Because he seems very fuddy-duddy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also... Um, there's a part where he's like, you know, he goes to America to retrieve Prince John uh, with Billy Baldwin. <laughs> he tried to retrieve him, and when Prince John says, fuck no, eventually he has to accept it, but he seems very huffy about the whole thing. Mm, yeah. I feel like he could have used a romance. Maybe Billy Baldwin. Maybe that would have worked out. Hey, yeah. I, think they'd be, I, I think they'd be a cute couple, and they've Agreed. been spending time together, obviously. Yeah, they seem they very comfortable. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then last, I guess Al the Baker, uh, I mean, he's got to go somewhere. And I guess he kind of, he, he's just there to bake and like be the place where people can come and fall in love. So I feel like what where, what else, where else does he go? I'm going to tell you, Emily, I don't think Al the Baker is a sassy sidekick, but Al the Baker as Santa Claus, definitely <gasps> yeah. a sassy sidekick. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. Now, number seven is our villain, which is usually an evil woman, occasionally a male boss. Uh, I th- I thought Billy Baldwin was going to fill that role, but I don't really Me understand too. what Billy Baldwin was doing here. It felt very much um, the the first movie I covered this year was the my Christmas fiance and Denise Richard basically played the same role, where it was like, oh, they got Denise Richards. She's the name of this movie. Is she the villain? No. Is she like the supportive Santa Claus ish person? No. Why is she in this movie? This Failed thing happens the all the time. Way. He would have been the villain if they had him for enough time. Maybe. But they didn't. So yeah. couldn't be the villain. And in fact, they really fucked up in this case because if you were going to, like, you could make a case that Chad is the villain, right? Because right. he is at least an ex. He's not an evil ex, really, but he's pushing Abigail pretty hard about going out on a. Yeah, she, date. she's got you really weird relationship case. things going on with men. Absolutely. You could also make a case that the prince's mother is mm-hmm. a villain. Yeah. Because she wants him to come back home for Christmas. And even his brother uh, is also sort of played as like the more negative kind of character. Um, I was very excited because I looked up the brother because, again, I was also trying to figure out who was British and who wasn't. <laughs> and um, the brother, the credit that excited me was that the, he plays one of the, like, Heinz executives on The Food That Built America, the documentary <laughs> series, that does reenactments. And the reenactments are always, like, wonderfully terrible. And that made me very happy. So I'm going to say they fucked up because I think yeah. the, the evil woman in this movie is Abigail herself. Yeah. Yeah. And they could have leaned into that and had her... I, it, oh man, like in a way, as I'm saying that, I'm like, no, I don't know that I wanted her to be like full out Moira Kelly in the Cutting Edge, where like she's just so unlikable. But at the same time, like instead, she's just sad. <laughs> it's just depressing. And I get that people are, but that's not why most people watch these movies. Wait, uh, she deserves. She deserves to be unhappy. I'm, I mean, yeah, that's a really horrible you. thing to say. No, you're, but, but you're it's, entirely it's correct. Absolutely the case. <laughs> yes. Uh, number eight is slapstick. Um, now. The, uh, their meat cute is a broken cake, kind of. Yes. Like it's not even that. Mm-hmm. Like it's not like it gets on her face. It's not nope, like it does falls not on get the on her face. It just gets doesn't even shaking. really get on her clothes though, because no. it's inside a box. It's in a box. Also, it breaks in a very unusual yeah. way. It doesn't get smushed. It gets sliced. Somehow. Like I guess Al is just the only <laughs> baker in town, which makes him both the best and worst. If you get my griff, you know. Yeah. Um. There's also like some ice skating hijinks, but not nearly enough. Like. There could be falls, there could be flips, there could be getting run over by a Zamboni, and that stuff does not happen. Uh, so number nine is our sage old person, or old people. Um, and the closest we come is got to be Abigail's parents, and we need to deal with them. Yeah, yeah, her mother is a little overbearing, mm-hmm. but then again, her daughter is an ice queen, also a figure skating yeah. queen, but definitely an ice queen. But I do have to say... I have a certain fondness for her father. I mean, her mother, too. Her mother seems... She's fine, right? I mean, these are perfectly uh, competent actors. I was just freaked out by how hard they were pushing this man on... on This man who they did not know at all on their daughter. Look, if you had to spend your time with this horrible woman all the time, 
anything that made her even <laughs> you the know? slightest bit happier. Somehow it just makes her madder and madder just yeah. to have this perfect man shoved in her face. I guess the idea of also like this this woman is still living in my house and I'm retired and every day I have to wake up to her sad face. Um, maybe just the whole like, please get marry her and bring her to your Belgian country. I, I get it. You're right. Yeah. So there is a scene in this movie where the prince runs into the mother. We don't see it. It happens off screen. Runs into her and she invites him home for dinner. And the dinner was cooked by the father, the the yep. uh, Abigail's father. And Emily, tell me what it is that her father cooked for them. Oh, I don't remember. Well, I'm glad that you didn't remember because it means that I get to say it instead. <sighs> because this movie doesn't have anything... When we describe it, it sounds, oh, that's kind of strange, kind of weird. It's not. It's kind of bland <laughs> and kind of uninteresting. But there is one weird thing that happens in this entire movie, and that is the meal that her <gasps> father cooked. We get an instant is it shot. Human? Just, it's not human. That's that is the most dangerous <sighs> game of all. No. He made pasta, but in his own special holiday way. So we get a two second shot of a of a like a container of pasta which is covered in peppermints. And that <laughs> is what he fed I them. Like that. peppermints, like classic like red and white striped peppermints. Yeah all over the top of this pasta. <laughs> and it's like, they even make a little joke. It's like, yeah, you might think that you're going to enjoy this dinner, Prince, but you don't know the kind of cooking he does. He's literally insane. <laughs> it's not even fucking... So this is, this is actually... Uh, now we know that this movie is set um, 20 years after the movie Elf. And <laughs> the father is the grown Will Ferrell and the mother is Zoe Deschanel. There's like it a conversation fits. between the parents about how the father's not allowed to like climb a ladder anymore, and I'm <laughs> right. like, oh, that's setting up something later, and it never happened. Oh, I thought the dad nothing. was going to die in this movie briefly. Yeah. I was like, they're doing a lot of that thing where they're well, talking after about all those peppermints. Uh... Maybe, maybe he did pass away. But anyway, <laughs> the one weird, oh, amusing, and interesting that? thing to happen. I miss in the that. <laughs> oh, oh, th- thank goodness I have you on for this because I, I am now like, um, you know, whipping myself for having missed that detail. But it's glorious, yeah. Because I also, wish I could say I forgive you, but absolutely you should unforgivable. Not. No, I that <laughs> no, I I deserve. I am going to after we are done. I am going to pack up, find the nearest ice rink that is open, and just lay myself on the ice and wait for the zamboni to come and run yeah. me over. That's the only way yeah. I can end this. It's really, it's really the figure skater version of a sky burial. It's where yes. you just lay on the ice and let the zamboni. <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> Uh, all right, so number 10, we said we kind of have a brief, briefly, we have Alice Santa Claus. and that's Yes, we have a Santa Claus. We have a Santa Claus. All right, so the bonus round, all those little things that come up. Um, of so much uh, public domain holiday songs. Um, mm-hmm. Any of your favorites show up here? I mean, they didn't do the sad uh, Silent no, Night in it. Yeah, and they really could have. Cause that's... They really could have. There's lots of sadness, lots of mopiness yeah. in it. Uh, none of it really stuck out. I fully expected Kevin McLeod to be uh, credited in the movie uh, because, uh, for those who don't know, Kevin McLeod is a purveyor of public do- domain music. Like he makes it available ah. for movies, and I see it in like low budget movies all the time, including even movies like this. Uh, but no, it's just you know, it's fine. It's all very seasonal. Mm-hmm. Um, I, can't, I can't think of anything that stood out in terms of the music whatsoever. No, I feel like there was a lot of "We Wish You a Merry Christmas." Like they used yeah. that like three times, which is one of my least favorite, just because it's so repetitive. But you know, you work with what you got, and you work uh, on the budget you got, and they, they do what they can. And Fred Holen Rain knows how to do that. He wrote a book about it. They, they, none of the music that I, I like, they kind of keep the religious uh, Christmas music out yeah. of it. And I think, you know, just another example of, like, not not even treading near the potential for anything yeah, anyone could yeah. ever get upset about. <laughs> yeah. Uh, know your audience. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Number two, our secret family recipe. Well, so, I <laughs> Like a literal pasta. one. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> oh, I'm going to try that. Um, that's my goal for like one of my resolutions for next year is like to learn how to make pasta, like make, make uh, handmade pasta. And now I know the secret is just to add peppermints. Uh, find the nearest old person, <laughs> raid their candy dish, and, and then give it a go. Um, all right. Number three is our small business in danger. Did you, is there a small business in danger? I mean, you would say yes, right? I mean, yeah. if, she, if she's putting on events using these people that she's training, she has to be licensed and bonded, you would think. I mean, she has to be uh, allowed to run the school. I guess yeah. you would call it a school. I guess she teaches a school. Her 
teaching her school for figure skaters is in danger of being closed forever. Yes, she yes. couldn't possibly find, I don't know, a fucking pond or something like that <laughs> for their once a year showing <laughs> off. I mean, but anyway, yeah, yeah small business is in danger. Yeah. Uh, product placement. I, I feel like this movie tr- probably tried to get product placement. <laughs> they probably wrote some letters to peppermint companies and and pasta companies and cupcake makers and said like, "Hey, can we use can we use your product in the movie?" Uh, as like a budget cutoff, but I, I don't think anybody took that bait. Look, unless Starlight Peppermint Mints are uh-huh. uh, so there's some company that really wants some connection with the pasta <laughs> industry, I can't say that I saw yeah. any uh, any yes. notable product yeah, placement. Same. Well, uh, I no. guess, I mean, oh, sorry, I should oh, say, please. we do have that shot in the stadium with the Buffalo Sabres in the background, True. which is not product placement, but somehow they were able to use an actual NHL hockey stadium. That is something, though I, I don't know if it was in the credits or anything. I didn't look. I, I wonder a few things if that was like Billy Baldwin who had an in who was like, yeah, yeah. sure, I'll do you a favor. Come on That's in. That's right, because we get another scene <laughs> don't of him bring, on, you on can't the bring phone. The, yeah, don't bring your equipment. Just bring your cell phone, record it that way. We'll ADR whatever we can. <laughs> Uh, Does he live at the stadium? Because, again, he gets a call <laughs> later. He's just sitting in one of the seats. <laughs> I mean, while filming this movie, he did. Because yeah. he did all of it in that stadium, I'm sure. Uh, number five is our cloying child. I think the old, there's not really kids in this movie. Again, mm-hmm. sometimes it's a budget thing because directors don't want to deal with kids. Sure. Um, we have, like, little cute ice skaters, and they're cute little ice skaters. So we'll, we'll give that one a pass. Uh, characters with holiday-themed names. No... I'm going to pretend that Prince John's last name was like Prince John Christmaston because that's more fun. Stockingston. Stockingston. Yes, indeed. <laughs> indeed, Inston. Uh, but yeah, nothing there. Uh, nothing about like finding the perfect tree or decorating, really, um, aside from decorating cupcakes. There is decorating cupcakes. But yeah. yeah. The trees are already perfect, but when they show up in this movie. Yes. Um, elaborately uh, complicated holiday cocktails or beverages. No. Um, empty coffee cup acting. You see a lot. Actors who are not overly versed in acting. Sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, often when they are tasked to hold a coffee cup, which they do a lot in these movies to establish that it's cold, uh, they have no idea how to fake that cup being filled. Um, this one, I don't think there was, but I did clock something of interest. Like, it's not the opening shot of this movie, because that's Abigail failing at her Olympic dream. Sure. But the shot introducing King John, Prince John is done like it's the one like artistic thing i think in this movie <laughs> where it feels and again i'm guessing fred olin ray was like just put the camera on the drink tray so the opening shot where we meet the prince is from the point of view of the drink tray as the assistant butler wheels it into the prince's room it feels very <laughs> elaborate for this movie <laughs> I mean, I guess maybe they had a little extra time, decided to throw in a little uh, little extra camera movement. But yeah, and also to establish, of course, they're drinking tea, right? Yes, they're those kind they're of people. British. Yeah, Belgian, this certainly wasn't filmed that's on the same some, thing, right? Wasn't filmed in some empty <laughs> fucking soundstage. All <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, number 10, uh, actors trying hard to not take a bite of food on camera. Um, I don't think anybody wanted to come near any of those cupcakes because I guarantee, like, they were, like, sat out in the sun all day long. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't think anybody was in danger of eating in this movie. They made all that to do about that fucking cake. And then we never see anyone never see nothing. eat the cake. No, nothing. And then later when uh, they're having dinner and the mom, who is, again, trying everything she can do to have Prince John's penis go into her daughter's vagina. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, uh mm-hmm. She's like, oh, I ordered dessert, but I forgot to pick it up. Why don't you go get dessert? Just even that and the way, like, then John is like, okay, we'll go to Al's. But the the logic of that doesn't make sense because the mother says, I ordered dessert. Yeah. So why don't they just go and pick up whatever she ordered? Well, she, I mean, look, I feel bad to say this, but (gasps) her mother ordered that several years ago and her brain is just not what it used to be. (laughs) I mean, she says that every time they get together. I mean, how else do you explain that pasta meal? This is a couple. This is like that M. Night Shyamalan movie. I mean, these this is a dangerous people to be around. Yeah, you do not. And it was nighttime, so yeah. everything goes to hell at that point. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, 11 and 12 kind of flow into each other, which is usually Canadianisms or signs that the movie was not filmed on location. But in this case, we have real snow. This was filmed in Western, not upstate New York. And there is snow on the ground. 
They make sure that we see their cold breath when they're out. <laughs> side at times though i have to say every time they did like establishing shots of the city and they started or the town they just started to use the same ones over and over and then they just show someone you know come in off of the street into like owls right yeah. they're obviously not coming from a cold place and they're like you know they're wearing like uh, mittens and things like that but they immediately take them all off because it's probably warm as hell yeah. there to be. but uh, but yeah there's not i mean I, I like the legitimacy of it i can i can peg that stuff from a mile away yeah. But I was hoping that this was filmed in Canada so I could bring in some of my Canadian expertise. Yeah, I, I mean, I didn't – usually, even if it's not filmed in Canada, you have some Canadians there. Yeah. Uh, but I didn't catch any accents. I didn't catch any aboots. No, no aboots and no yeah. uh, no sorries. No, no. Very disappointing. Uh, but that is A Royal Christmas on Ice. Now, uh, Doug, I know this is not your genre of choice, but mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, in comparison to other movies like this that you've seen – um, where do you think it falls, and do you recommend it to anybody? Well, again, knowing that I am not an expert in this material, I can't speak for its quality uh, in terms of like the oeuvre of mm-hmm. these Christmas movies, which I know there are more and more of them to the point where <laughs> they so just many. show there's really a lot. And if I had to... If the question is what I recommend this movie... Mm. I can't imagine anyone I know or (laughs) that... Respect. I don't see why people enjoy these movies. This is going to go into a little bit of a rant. I understand the the pleasures of something that's very light. It's like a romance novel. I get it. Right, and something that's it's inoffensive and predictable, but it always has a happy ending. I get where why people are like looking for something like that in a world that's very tumultuous sure. and very unpredictable. Something that's very relaxing like that. I can see why people can just put it on in the background or just watch them again and again. Um, but it is definitely bad for your brain to watch these. Mm-hmm. It's and it's also bad, I think, for your expectations of what the world is like. To me, it's kind of fit if it's into like the like people's. Uh, weird nostalgia not for the 80s but like the weird mm. for, for a, a world that never existed yeah this so idea that oh if things used to be great or things could be great in if everybody was like a hallmark christmas movie the world would be great and right. it, no it wouldn't be and it's, also it's, yeah there's a lot of and this one i think was one that for me really brought it out of the dark and i always say most of these movies if you took out the christmas decorations and put on a different soundtrack you have a lifetime stalking thriller you have a story about a man who is weirdly obsessed with a woman who doesn't want anything to do with him and he wins her over and in these movies it's treated as if it's a great thing and most of the time they're fairly innocent and even here and there some of them have been like genuinely you know, no, 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 this is positive. This is sweet. This is something that makes you feel good. But this is the prime example of the kind that I think is a little dangerous. And because this one also just is ugly and like not cute and doesn't even have the, the prettiness of cute decorations and happy people, it just feels more obvious how dark this idea really is i think part of it is that we know that fred olin ray used to make material that he mm. cared about so the fact that he obviously doesn't give a shit about making yeah. anything good like no one here wants to make anything good they know exactly what they're doing yes. they're doing it perfectly fine but they also know their audience and their audience doesn't really want anything good they don't want right. anything artistic or challenging they don't want a person of color in there who does anything except provide cupcakes right i mean they don't want anything that can break the spell of what this movie provides and i do think that that's a little bit depressing but again my i'm i'm looking at it from a very small perspective right and i don't want to just like poo poo something that mm-hmm. people really do enjoy but it's also just like how many is enough of this right well, don't we get don't we have enough of these? <laughs> I will say, because I think I have I have felt similarly most of the time I've been doing this is why I started doing these. Sure. Was years ago, kind of stumbling on these and realizing the formula was so clear and yet people love them. And I should say, by the way, that? what you were saying is absolutely right. You just need to make a little twist and this is a thriller. It's a, it's but a that dark, that's actually dark tale. just as much. Like those movies those cookie cutter thrillers that are spit out. There's just as many of those. This could yeah. be called the wrong prince or the wrong <laughs> figure skater. And suddenly you have that movie as well. Yeah. But like that is, that's a real condemnation of how little fucking creativity Completely. goes into these things. Now the flip of that is that this year in particular, I'll say I've watched a few of them where you are seeing 
a little bit more steps forward and it was a very slow process but like over at hallmark the leadership changed and very clearly if you look at the hallmark roster there is um there are is a movie or two that has a central queer romance uh there are more people of color she is exactly like it's woke and she's got she did she's like she was like i went to a new and if you've i don't know if you've seen the commercials but now the commercials for the Great Family Network or whatever shit it oh is, it's like her saying, come to my new home where we celebrate American Christmas, which just means white straight Christmas. Yeah. But the fact that she left Hallmark and the fact that Hallmark basically said, you know, we, we're we going to give more opportunity. We're going to go in more directions. And Lifetime was already better at that to begin with uh, and has been more actively like the last couple of years almost every year there was a gay movie or some little steps forward. And like the, the last Hallmark uh, movie I watched this year was um, Three Wise Men and a Baby. And it is on one level very much every one of these movies, except it's not. It's not really a romance. It's actually very sweet. It addresses like anxiety and mental illness without sugarcoating things and having an easy answer like but yet it's done in a sheen of all the christmas music and everybody's wearing red and green and all of those things so like there is now that i think the formula is out there for so long um and it's kind of like this with, with any form of art right that you do blanket the world with it and then because it's so easy to make zombie movies right you had years of every low-budget filmmaker would make a zombie movie, and most of them were shit. But because it was out there, it meant that creative, like, actually innovative filmmaker who had something to say could make that zombie movie, and sure, it might get lost by most people in a sea of other low-budget crap, but enough people will say, wait a minute, this one's really good. You know, it's funny that you say that, and you're right. That's exactly what you would hope would happen, is when you have so many of one thing, then certain people have the freedom a little bit Mm -hmm. of freedom they're able to get a little weird some of them are going to rise to the top some of them are going to distinguish themselves but the funny thing about this as a trend is that when you talk about something like zombie movies or or any other genre where where there's a lot of kind of cookie cutter versions of it is that it usually starts out good and this one didn't have a start out that there isn't like you can't point to this one or two or three of these big lifetime Mm. movies that were like, this is the sterling example, and now everything is just taking its lead from it. Right. Uh, at least that's my perspective. Again, maybe there are ones that people really see from like five or ten years ago where it's like they were really putting out high quality productions back then, and it's no. gotten to a low state. It's and now to me the complete really reverse. I think yeah. they started like crap. They started as easy things to film. Um, it, they were, you know, geared, especially in the lifetime days, they were geared towards women easy to find the right actress for most of these parts um and they were the earlier ones are even more generic um and it's really i think been the last couple of years where you've had a little more freedom um weirdly some like freeform which used to be abc family used to do christmas originals and they would do good ones not great but there was something about that network that had a different approach to it where they felt like different movies and they felt like they were hitting the same notes, but that within them, there were better performances. There were funnier scripts. Um, they were a little more modern. Um, that one of them has a character who ends up alone, who chooses not to be with anybody. Like you had some of that there. Um, and that has, I think slowly leaked other places now that Netflix is making them. And I don't think Netflix makes great ones, but Netflix has that, added bonus of because of their audience they can have more gay themes they can be a little more sassier and a little bit kind of more risque which then forces lifetime to do the same it forces hallmark to understand this movie is either purely innocent or this one's going to be a little sassy so i think in its own way um and i guess this is a capitalist thing the more the freer the market the more um it kind of it's like what what we say in like my industry of like how competition can be really good for a company because it forces you forward. It forces you to find ways around the competition. My, I don't think it happened in this movie, but I mean, I'm an anti-capitalist, so that makes it <laughs> a little uncomfortable for me. There is another part of this that I haven't really addressed either, which is the idea that it does give opportunities to filmmakers who 
need, you know, need to sure. be able to work quickly and competently. And uh, I'm thinking specifically of Justin uh, Dick, who a Canadian director mm-hmm. who's made a bunch of these, and he made that movie Anything, Anything for, for Jackson. Jackson. Which That's is right, so good. which was really good. And then you know he's pumping out like four or five of these mm-hmm. Christmas movies a year. If if like even someone like Fred Olin Ray, if he wanted to make you know. 10 for them, one for me, that sort of thing. Maybe sure. it keeps their career going. Maybe it's what they do to pay the bills in between larger projects, or maybe it's a way mm-hmm. to save up money for other projects. There is something to be said for people working. And also, as we yeah. said already, there's a lot of actors, older actors in particular, I think like a Michael Gross sure. or something like that, who, who, you know, people, sitcom actors who like these are, this is their bread and butter now. This yeah. is how they keep their careers kind of going. And it is nice to see these faces pop up. One mm-hmm. of those categories on your list should be who is the celeb du jour, right? Ooh, who's the you're person, right. <laughs> who's the person who shows up that you actually recognize? Yeah. Um, and it is, and sometimes, you know, those David Dakota movies, every once in a while you'll have like three or four. It's like, oh, he picked a few like old cult actors and things like that and tossed them in there. I'm sure Fred does it as well. And like, that is fun. Yeah. It's fun to see, you know, them appear and pop up. But, uh, and again, look, and, and this is still, I've seen some of those David Dakota movies. <laughs> <laughs> he... He's probably working with – I don't mean you think he would have bigger budgets than Fred Olin Ray has here. But anyway, I don't want to get into the competition between the two. All I'm saying <laughs> is um, I don't know if this is a sterling example of what one of these movies is or if it's smack dab in the middle. Uh, I'm sure there are ones that do distinguish themselves, and I hope, as you were suggesting, that there's going to be more to come in regards to that. Mm-hmm. Maybe ones that take some chances in regards to the casting or in the setting or just just taking into weird places. I'd love it to see it get weird. There's no reason for it oh, not yeah. to. Um, but in terms of this one specifically, going to have to tell everybody I know, <laughs> even figure skating enthusiasts, especially that probably figure skating maybe enthusiasts. especially. The only the only exception to that is potentially my mother, who if uh, this might be the one movie I've seen this year that I could recommend to her, <laughs> she might be able to enjoy. <laughs> yeah, I would say this is below average for Cozy Cardigan Christmas. I think both in terms of like it looks cheap, it feels cheap, it doesn't have much charm. The charm comes from watching and really pulling it apart of some of the weird things in it, but it's right. not a joyous watch. This is not one I would tell anybody to go check out. So, uh, un- unless you're like me and like the the worst they are, kind of get a weird enjoyment out of it. But <laughs> thankfully, is, I wish I wish it was any. bad. Like I mean, it's bad. I, yeah. Certainly, it's bad. But I just wish. Yeah, I wish it was. I wish it was bad in a way that was interesting as mm-hmm. opposed to competent in a way that isn't. So it's just, sure. we had, we picked out and we picked this apart and we told you listener every yeah. single thing that anyone could possibly care about this. <laughs> and really all we came up with was spaghetti with mint spaghetti on it. Spaghetti with peppermint, <laughs> peppermint pasta. Ah, that's, that's my new Charlie Brown peanuts name. <laughs> All right. Well, Doug, uh, when not talking about mediocre and below average Christmas movies, what do you talk about? Where can people find you? Well, my weekly podcast is Cinema Smorgasbord, which is a umbrella podcast that houses a lot of themed podcasts. Of course, it has the legendary Eric Roberts is the fucking man now in the form of Eric Roberts is the fucking man redux. But we also have the Paul Bartel podcast, Bartel Me Something Good. Uh, we have George Kennedy is my co-pilot, a podcast devoted to the great George Kennedy. The Alejandro Jodorowsky podcast, Jodorowsky, where we're going chronologically through his career. We do our own stunts, a podcast devoted to the career of Jackie Chan. Wild in the Streets, devoted to Eurocrime. You don't know Dick about the great Dick Miller. We have Praising Kane about the great Carol Kane. We're going chronologically through her career. And we have How Do You Do Fellow Kids, devoted to Steve Buscemi. Among others, you can find that over at cinemasmorgasbord.com or on Twitter at cinemasmorg, S-M-O-R-G. Or if you just want to follow me on Twitter, at it's at Doug underscore Tilly. That's T-I-L-L-E-Y. Nice. Uh, quick question before we go. Do you pick the actor you're going to cover based on whether you can make a pun out of their name? Or do you pick the actor and then find a way to make the pun? The enthusiasm has to be there first. Uh, oh, some of these okay. podcasts have been started by other people. But, of course, I'm uh, one of the co-hosts on all of them. Uh, so Bart, tell me something good came about by someone else's interest. I did uh, Jodowski, but we need to come up with a good name because it's got to be quirky. It's got to be fun, Obviously. right? Uh, and and I like some of these names more than I like others. <laughs> <laughs> but I was uh, I was just talking to someone today about a potential future podcast devoted to the career of the great Oliver Reed, uh, which would be, I think, amazing. And I hope that this idea does come to pass. And uh, the, the suggestion that I gave for a title, no one else steal this, please, was... Reading in the years. <laughs> so uh, we'll see if that ever happens. But we'll Re- find reading it. in the... I, 
reading in the years. like reeling in the years. Re- oh, but reading. Song, but it's reading in the. Hmm. You know, when I said it out loud just then, I suddenly realized that people would hear it as reading, yes. as in R E A D I N G, and then it becomes a terrible uh, 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 a thing to have as the uh, podcast name. But you know what? We'll workshop it and we'll make okay. it work. Okay. And if you never hear about an Oliver Reed themed podcast, then I guess the workshopping did not come. I guess it all uh, came down to, to the fruition. name. Well, yeah, I will right. definitely listen to an Oliver Reed themed podcast. Uh, Particularly if you cover his sexier work, which is really all of his work. All of his work. All, is exactly. Sexy. So danger, dangerous times there. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Doug, for uh, putting yourself through this experience. Uh, everybody has heard where to find him, and we will be back again soon with yet another stocking stuffer, hopefully with better ice skating and with better pasta. <laughs> Can I have-